Welcome to Inside the Octagon. I'm John Gooden alongside our Chief Analysis Officer, Dan Hardy. Our focus today is UFC 203 and the big guys in the co-main, plus the strawweights on the main card. Travis Brown was once a man with the UFC heavyweight title firmly in his sights, but Fabricio Verdun went on to eventually claim the gold after their eliminator bout in April 2014. Stipe Miocic has since ended that reign and both men meet again, eager to get their careers back on track. We'll also take a look at two excellent prospects in the strawweight division as Jessica Andrade and Joanne Calderwood face off in a bid to establish themselves as the next contender to face Joanna Jungjajic. Tough to call, but try we shall. The analysis is coming up. So Dan, another massive one, because it's the heavyweights at UFC 203. <laughs> and this is a rerun of a fight that happened back in April 2014. The difference being this one is over three rounds. Yes, yeah. And it's always interesting when two guys are fighting again. And I always like to review the first fight, which we're going to do in a second. Um, a lot changed for Travis Brown after this first fight. I think he felt like he was well on the way to becoming the UFC champion. And I think a lot of people around him were saying the same kind yeah, of thing. That's so when he ran, it ran into Fabricio Verdum and was effectively outclassed in every range, it was a real wake-up call for him. And we saw developments in his game from that point onwards that really will pay dividends moving forward if he is to ever, ever actually get a hold of that title. He's going to need all of these lessons from Verdum. So I think we should start, obviously, with the first one. Let's go for it. So let's get into it straight away. Now, obviously, there's a slight height reach advantage for Travis Brown. But the one, the one thing that really stood out from early on was every time he throws one shot, Vadum comes back with five or six. And with an attitude as well. Like there was a, even at the end of the first round, he kind of flinched at him to try and get a reaction out of him. Like this was a real, a real statement of confidence for Vadum. To Travis Brown's credit, every time he was taken down, he worked hard to get back to his feet. He's very good at stripping grips away from people and peeling, peeling hands off and, and getting back to his feet, creating space. And when he is in a clinch, he's very good at, at, at keeping distance from his opponent, forcing their, forcing their head away, forcing their body away and scramble into the fence to get back to his feet. This is something that is really integral to his game, something that obviously he's been working with. Ricky Lundell, take down the fence against the fence and get him back up, and then scrambles when you're in a bad position. The amount of people that have been taken down by Verdum and submitted, and Travis Brown was not one of those guys. Yeah. He, he spent 25 minutes with one of the best jiu-jitsu players in the world and, and didn't get submitted. But he did get tired. He did start to slow down. We saw his movement become quite laboured. And Fabricio Verdum just seemed to pick up his pace. I don't think we give him enough credit for his conditioning. This was a five round fight with a big heavyweight and he just threw him around, he handled him everywhere. All that we saw from Travis Brown was that constant heart, getting back to his feet, his, his unwillingness to, to break under the pressure. Even right on the end of the jab, right, right when he's getting picked off and he just can't get his hands on Verdum. The, the frustration didn't get to him, it didn't break him. Right at the end of the fifth round, he's still pushing, he's still backing his opponent up, still trying to get that finish. And it really is a statement to, to the kind of fighter that he is, because going into this next fight, it's only technical things that he's got to take care of. Right. It, it's only, I mean, look at that beautiful body kick. There were a lot of things that were brought to his attention in this fight that I don't think anybody else had. And the confidence that Fabricio Verdum stepped into this fight with was something that Brown wasn't expecting. When, when you're stepping in against someone who's six foot seven, who has got scary power in both hands, most of the time he commands that kind of respect that he didn't get off Vadum. And that was a, you know, a, a good opportunity for Vadum to show what he's capable of, and then obviously moved him into the, the, the title picture, which he made the most of. So although it was a disappointing fight on the night for Travis Brown, I think it set him in, in, in great uh, momentum for his, next, for his next opportunity for a title shot or a title eliminator, which is obviously where we're getting to right now. Yeah, well, this is an opportunistic situation for him because yeah. Ben Rothwell was injured, so he steps into the fold and gets a, an opportunity back at Verdun. He's, a, he's such a great striker, though. He's a very attractive striker to watch, uh, particularly with his elbows. And when I was looking mm. through his, his record, it's just knockout by elbows, elbows, yeah. elbows. Very rarely seen. Yeah. But I guess when you're as tall as him and reaching from the lighting <laughs> rig and pulling those elbows down onto people's faces, yeah. that's what tends to happen. Can generate so much force. Uh, and and is the, has that, that typical BJ Penn Hawaii mentality of, <laughs> yeah. I've come to scrap. Yes. You know, if you hit me with a good clean shot, I'm going to take it and I'm going to come back at you. I mean, if we watch his fight against Andre Arlovsky, that was really a statement to, to the heart and tenacity of Travis Brown. Even though he lost that fight, 
he was in it right until the end. Yeah. You know, that knockdown that he got against Orlovsky got everybody out there. So yes. you'll see Joe Rogan jump out of his seat while he's commentating. You always know that Brown's in the fight because he's always got that one punch, that one shot that he can land. Now, there are some, some things that stand out. You mentioned the elbows, and that was something really important to talk about. But this clip here against Brendan Schaub was his first fight back after the Vadum fight. And what you'll see is every time Schaub's pushing forward, he's moving back, he's creating space, which he wasn't doing in the Vadum fight. He was standing in front of him and eating those combinations. Now, he withstood a hell of a barrage from Overeem in the first minute of this fight, and then came back by keeping a tired Overeem at a distance. You can see him taking some deep breaths because he gave it everything to try and get that fight finished, and didn't because of the toughness of Brown. And then when Brown finally managed to get his head back, he started to pick him off with the long front kicks, the head kicks, just kept Overeem guessing, kept switching up the range, the direction, the placement of the kick, body, head, turning to the side, even catching him on his hands he wasn't too bothered about. And he's also got great takedown defense. Even when he's tired, he's got great takedown defense. So no matter how many times he gets taken down, if he can keep getting back up, Vadum is gonna keep being forced to negotiate that range and work through this stage here. Now, if Vadum gets him up against the fence, this is something that anybody's got to watch out for. He did it against Gonzaga, and he refined it against Josh Barnett. Look at this beautiful movement here. Anti-clinch, denying the clinch, and as soon as he's backed up, a really nice knee there, which we're going to see in the replay, was the beginning of the end, and then the, the elbows come again. And you can see how he's refined this technique. He's, he's drawing these elbows back into his opponent. There's the knee. You can see immediately that Barnett's hurt, and then he sl splits his base to defend the takedown, and these elbows are coming clean. Look how they're firing straight through his opponent. Really nice, nicely placed elbows and a, and a really underutilized technique. But when you're six foot seven, you're defending, defending takedowns against the fence, you can generate massive amounts of power into those shots. And most people don't want to stand and trade with a six foot seven guy, which was a surprise for me when Vadum, you know, took it to him on the feet. Yeah. But in this fight, I've got to feel like Vadum's going to be a bit more cautious. He's going to be a bit more respectful of what Travis Brown's capable of. Seeing the developments in his game since that first fight and knowing the potential that Travis Brown's got, I think he's got to be a bit more strategic. But Fabricio Vadum is one of those guys that just brings a wealth of experience and, and he has beaten some of the best guys around. I mean, this, this fight against Nogueira was a, a very good statement, an overall statement of what he's capable of. Good footwork to start with, chopping him out down with low kicks. Great head movement, watch this really nice right hand here and a roll after it. Boom, and then rolled straight underneath, reset, and he's ready to take on his opponent again. He was controlling that range. And this was something that was interesting as well. Now in the Fedor fight, he slipped on the mat, he lost his foot in, and in a scramble on the floor, he managed to get this, this triangle locked up, isolated the arm, and got a very reluctant tap out of Fedor. Now in previous fights, we've seen him play possum a little bit. That overhand right that Mark Hunt threw there, I'm just gonna skip that back so you can watch it uh, at a slower speed. Mark Hunt knows that punch didn't land cleanly, and so, so does Fabricio Vadum. And the thing that gave it away for me is that when Vadum's going down, he puts his hand down to stop himself. Now, this, this is a very smart tactic for a world-class Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu fighter, because in that moment where you see someone go crashing to the canvas, you think they're hurt, your natural reaction most of the time is to run in and sprint on it, just yeah. like Fedor did in Strike Force. When he runs in, he goes straight into a triangle armbar. He tries to play this same game now. It was almost like he learned that lesson from Fedor and he's like, oh, this is maybe a, an ace card that I can throw in. If I can't get the fight to the floor, maybe the, you know, the Diaz effect in a way. Put, the, put pressure on them, get them to take down, get them to land a clean shot, get them to rush into my guard and okay. give me the position that I want. So if you watch this play out, as Mark Hunt throws this overhand right, you'll see it just glance across the top of the head. And Vadum's hands down. He knows exactly what yeah. he's doing. And so does Mark Hunt. He's figured this out. So as soon as he sees his opponent go crash into the floor, Hunt stops. He takes a minute. Vadum smiles because he <laughs> realizes it's not going to work. Yeah. And then I've Mark Hunt rumbled. steps back. Exactly. Yeah. This is something that he's used quite, quite a few times. And in, even, in, uh, even later on in the fight, you'll see him get knocked down. And then he scoops and tries to catch an ankle. <laughs> and watch Mark Hunt's face here. The little eyebrow raise. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I just love that moment. And this is another technique that he uses, another trick that he uses. So obviously that first takedown failed. He shot him for that front leg of Mark Hunt, and Mark Hunt's got a good takedown offense. He sprawled, he defended that takedown. So now he's expecting that front leg attack again. Vadum's eye line. We, took, we spoke about it with Anderson Silva. You're gonna do laser eyes again? I am gonna do laser eyes again. Because this is something there you can see, just there. You can see what he's looking at. His eye sight is going straight down to that front leg. 
That's, that's, the, that's his laser beam. That's, I'm going for that front leg. So Mark Hunt, now he's reading that. He didn't fall for the trap of running into his guard, but he did fall for this trap. So Vadum's looked at his front leg. Boom, he comes straight up with the knee. Tricky little character, Very isn't tricky. It? Experience, you yeah. know, he's an older guy, he's in his late 30s, he's been in a lot of fights, he's been on the mat a lot of times, he's, he's trained a lot of fighters as well, so th there's a lot of experience, a lot of these little tricks that we pass back and forth amongst fighters. I've shown people these tricks before and watched them use them straight away in fights, and you know, every now and then you can just catch that, that automatic programming that people have of, yes. I see the level change, I'm going to level change. I see them go down, I'm going to run into his guard. He plays to those, those, that programming that people have in their subconscious, and a lot of the time it works. If he doesn't get the fight to the ground in that way, he does have some really nice takedowns. And this one, again, it's an earlier fight against Brandon Vera, which I believe was in Manchester, if I remember right. It was Manchester or London, one of the two. But as you, as you can see here, as he drops his level, that front leg that you'll see firing straight through between Brandon Vera's legs here, let me just highlight that for a second. So we're watching this foot here. It comes in and it hooks around that front leg and then he just collapses, which is basically putting a lot of pressure on that front knee of Brandon Vera. So you either, you either get taken down or you try and defend and put your knee in a lot of damage, a lot of danger. So as this plays on here, beautiful wrap and take down. And then up against the fence as well, you'll see a really nice little trip that he uses here. Very, very sneaky little tactic, just removing people's guard, people base, dropping into the mat. And then you're in his world. And when he starts to progress, it's a very fast progression. It's a very difficult situation to get out of once he's on the top. And he is more than happy to open up and strike. A lot of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioners will get to that position and they'll start to work submissions. He will beat you up to open that submission up. And this is something else that we talked about before. The first shot came, managed to pass his guard, but the second one, we see Vadum whip that, that foot up at the, on the outside to catch Cain Velasquez and, and, and force him into that guillotine position. So he's wrapped the guillotine there and he's also caught him in the guard. That won him the heavyweight title. Yeah. And that was an adjustment that he made because the first time Cain shot in, he didn't catch him with that leg. So he was forced to sweep him and create a scramble out of it. The second time around, he was expecting it, the leg came up and he's finished the guillotine. He's a very, very smart fighter. You know, that's why I don't think he's going to be as aggressive with Travis Brown this time around because he knows what Travis Brown has to offer. He's seen his fights recently. He knows the adaptations in his game. He's going to be aware of those really evil elbows against the fence, so he's not going to spend too much time on his legs. So these little tricks that he uses, the, the trying to pull guard, the trying to fool people with the knee, all things Brown's got to watch out for. I also think it's worth saying that Verdum is going to be very aware of the mistakes that he made in his last fight as well, going chasing after the victory. Yeah. So he's going to be a little less emotionally invested in that way and might, yeah, just hold back a little bit. Mm. Uh, but a great fight nonetheless. Great fight. Will they level the score? <laughs> we shall see. Another great fight which we wanted to take a look at is between Jojo Calderwood and Jessica Andrade. They've been playing at different weight classes, both of these fighters. Mm. The non-existent 125-pound class for Joanne Calderwood, where she looked great in her last fight against Letourneau. But Jessica Andrade is a former 135er who's come down. Damn, she's aggressive. Yes. She yes. is a very exciting fighter to watch. I'll never forget that fight she had with Rosie Sexton, obviously a, a friend of ours, mm. and it was... It was an obliteration. She, she's vicious. As Mike Goldberg always points out to Joe, her nickname, Joe, translates to pile driver. <laughs> Honestly, there's no better nickname for her. She Fantastic. Is... Uh, <laughs> That's terrible. Got I apologise to everybody in America. Um, it, she's, she's just such an aggressive, like, uh, she's a wave of aggression when she yeah. starts fighting. She's a Tasmanian devil. I mean, she really does just flurry forward. And one thing that I noticed, and we've only seen one fight at straw weight with her so far, one thing I noticed is the difference in speed. I mean, that 20 pounds difference between the bantamweight category that she was fighting at and now at straw weight at 115 is massive. Yeah. And considering she's only 5'2 as well, that's not a huge frame to carry that additional weight, so it does slow her down. We saw the difference that it made to Connor, just having a few extra pounds on his frame at welterweight. It does make a difference, it does tax your cardio. So the straw weight version is even more scary than the bantamweight version. Okay. L let, me, let me just show you what I'm talking about. So look at that stare in her eyes to start with. She's, she's an assassin. In a rematch against Raquel Pennant, she came out very aggressive. And you can see she's a, she's a swarming kind of fighter. She puts you under a lot of pressure early on. If she sees you're hurt, she will not let you up. She will not let you breathe. And she has the condition and the cardio to keep her pace on. And particularly at, at straw weight, surely her conditioning's got to be better. 
She's happy to stand in the, in the clinch and, and punch her way out. She's happy to stand her ground if you're attacking her and strike. And her takedown defense is great as well. Watch this against, against Sarah Marais. Circles off against a much bigger woman as well. Good head position. And then as she's backing up here, what I want to show you is where her eyesight is, what she's looking at. She's acknowledging where that right foot is. So as they're backing up here, she's just checking that. She's, she's got her eye line down, she's looking where that foot is. And what we're going to be paying attention to in this clip here is the right foot. Because this is going to come across. She's going to, she's going to move this right foot across. Let me just play it on just a little bit further so you can see what I'm talking about. She's going to step this foot across. You can already see her turning her hips there. Yep. So what we're going to see, we're going to, we're going to see this foot step across here, which is going to block the back foot of Sarah Marais, which is also going to bring her hip in front of her opponent as well, which effectively builds a wall. It builds a block here, which means that she's got a pivot point. Do you know what I mean? She can yeah. drag her opponent over, obviously blocking the foot as well and the hip as a secondary, as a secondary block. Um, and what I want you to focus on as well is we've got this hand here and then we've got the underhook on the far side. Lots of levers. Lots of levers. Yeah. She, and, and because her opponent's driving into her, she can utilize that force. Now, um, my judo's not great, but I believe this is some kind of hybrid Tayatoshi where she's, she's basically blocking with her foot, pivoting her opponent. But what we're gonna see is we're gonna see her lift with her underhook and pull down with this hand here, which will then allow her to pivot and pull her opponent over the side and uh, credit to Marias's flexibility she manages to get guard back but I don't know how I mean it's, it's a really nice takedown that we see here steps across her opponent goes straight and she manages to catch this leg underneath I don't know how great flexibility but really good takedowns really powerful takedowns and, and what's important in this fight against Joe Calderwood is obviously Joe Calderwood likes a tie clinch. She's a okay. tie boxer, so she's going to be driving forward. That's going to be something that she's got to watch out for if that momentum can be used against her. And it's not, it's, that's not the only time we've seen it in our fights as well. We've seen it a few times. And if she defends a takedown or if she reverses and ends up in top position, she will thunder down with hammer fists to get you to move, to get you to react. Here's another one against Raquel Pennington, a beautiful little hit throw. And we're going to see it against Pacheco here. She had to adapt this one slightly, straight into side control. And then same thing again, knee on belly, she starts hammering away, she starts landing good clean shots to force her opponent to move, to open up things. Watch this beautiful guillotine here. She wraps it, she steps over and wraps the far leg as well to, to, to control that roll, to stop Pacheco moving. And if we look here as well, we can see she's also got the arm caught. Yeah. And then all we're looking out for here, the arms under the neck, we're looking at a spine flexion to, to basically elongate this section of her opponent's neck here and emphasize that choke. There was nothing that she could do. She's got she's a totally leg wrapped. She's euthanized both yeah. arms. Absolutely helpless. She's tied her up perfectly. It's really nice. And we just let that play on. There's the guillotine. That's the only submission we've seen in the UFC of her so far, but she does have, I think, five guillotines on her record. So it is a, 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 you know, a very strong weapon for her. Her debut against Jessica Penne at strawweight just really stood out how much quicker she is at this weight class. She doesn't look any weaker, she doesn't particularly look any smaller. She looks leaner and faster, and that's scary. And this is what I'm talking about with this swarm, because not every one of these punches is gonna knock you out. Joanna does this as well, Joanna Champion does this. She will swarm on you and land that one clean shot that does the damage, and that's the shot there. Solar plexus, you can see Jessica Penne, she collapses. Andrade just keeps the pace on. And this here, when the referee's going, move fighter, move fighter, that is just fuel for her fire. She's gonna keep punching, keep that pace on. And look, not even interested in landing those shots because she's looking for the big shots that are gonna get through the guard. She will distract you with several punches to land that one clean one, j just like Joanna Champion does. So it's, it's a, a development that we see in the lighter weight classes that we don't see at heavyweight necessarily. We talked about that in the other show. Heavyweights have got that one punch knockout power. With the lighter weight classes, uh, flyweight up to sort of featherweight really, maybe, maybe bantamweight, they can throw a high volume of strikes to disguise that one shot. Yeah. We also talked about it with Chuck Liddell, Tito Ortiz, you remember with the crazy monkey blocking? Yeah, and then straight through the middle. Bam, 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 bam. Sometimes the, the strikes are not there to, there to hurt. There, there is a smoke screen for the yes. one punch that's going to get through. And Jessica Andrade is very good at disguising that one punch. The, the speed that you spoke about that she had at 135 is excellent. At 115, something else. But it's that added pace factor. Yes. It's, she's able to put on a pace for the fight, that, her aggressive pace. 
And I think that could be a bit of a problem for, for Joanne Calderwood, who has a very much a Muay Thai pacing where she flurries a yes. little bit. But she does have a very nice way of slowing fights down as well. We'll see if uh, she can do that against Andrade. Yeah. And it's also worth noting, I mean, uh, just the comparison of, of Andrade on the scales as well. You know, ha having, having the, well, we, we've got the pictures, got right? Pictures, yeah, so yeah. Let, just look at this. I mean, she doesn't look any smaller at, at, at straw weight than she did at bantam weight. All I can see the difference is, is in the, the, the vascularity of her muscles, how much leaner she is right. at straw weight. All she's done is she's just shed that excess weight that she didn't need to be carrying. Okay. And because it was excess weight, it wasn't serving her in the fight, you know. And when she's five two, she's fighting. I mean, Holly Holm was in that same weight class, you know. Yeah. They're, they're massively yes, different yeah, in size. Of so in order to, to strip a bit of extra body fat and get her down into a weight class where she's now contending against women that are the same size, I mean, even still a little bit taller, but physically, muscular wise, they're the same size. She stands a far better chance of having a run at that belt and, and ripping through Jessica Penne in her debut for that weight division mm. was a huge statement, really big. So turning our attentions to Joanne Caldwell, and I think that she looks better at 115. I think she did, 125, I didn't think she looked as athletic as what she does at 115, and, yep. and she does great work there as well. Sounds like she's now much more settled at TriStar. She was having some issues back in Scotland. Looks like she's put that behind her, and now she is fully focused on making a run at the title. Yes, yeah, well that, that fight at flyweight against, uh, against Valerie Latona really, for me, was a turning point for her. I mean, she's, she's been a long-time favourite of mine, Joanne Calderwood. I like her, her classical Muay Thai training. I like how vicious she is. She's mean, and she we is. hadn't seen her being as mean recently. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, if you look at that weight class, there aren't many women in that weight class that you could say that to. Obviously, Jessica Andrade is one, Joanna Jacek's the other. You know, just, just naturally a mean person. Yeah. Has that, that, that venom behind the strikes that she lands and will capitalise. If you crack, if you run away, she'll chase after you. But the classical Muay Thai training is really what's going to help her in this fight by maintaining that distance, discouraging her opponent rushing forward and into the clinch with those elbows and knees. I mean, those, that, that, the knee to the midsection was massive and then the elbows to follow it. And then the spinning attack as well is something that we're yes. seeing a development. Valerie Latona learns about it. We've seen it in spinning back kicks in several fights. Courtney Casey learned about it in this fight in particular because she got dropped in the last round with it. And this is her again, standing her ground, will take a punch to give a punch, and he's confident in her power. But watch this beautiful back kick here. She steps back, she sets her opponent, boom, right in the midsection and, nice. and drops Courtney Casey to the... And this is that killer instinct that she will just jump on you. Always focused on taking the fight away from you, chopping with elbows, really nasty, mean stuff. Hell bones. Yeah, and stuff that you can't train in the gym. You yeah. can't hit your opponent, or you can't hit your training partners with elbows. You can't throw full power spinning back kicks like that. So the only time you know they work is when you get to do them against a real life opponent, just like this teep. You would not do that to a training partner. That's something that is inbuilt in you. That is something that you've thought about over and over again. I'm a teeper in the face. That's really going to upset her. And you've got to think a lot of the attack of Jodo Calderwood is the knee coming up the centre, the teep coming up the centre, which we saw against Valerie Latorno, and the spinning attack as well. So the spinning back kick obviously comes straight forward, and that's going to be another deterrent for Jessica Andrade running forward. Look at the placement on that spinning elbow, though, right on the chin. Couldn't have been more perfectly timed or placed. And that got Valerie Latorno's respect for any headshots, mm. which then opened up the midsection, and she started to pick with the teep, the skip teep. Valerie Latorno shows she was hurt. Joe Calderwood swarmed on her, but the referee gave her a little time and she recovered. But the second time, she didn't. Watch this. Turns away, fight's over. <laughs> Joe Calderwood sprints at her, finishes the fight with a spinning back fist. These two women will not back down. I've got goosebumps I'm thinking about it. It's so <laughs> exciting because they're so tenacious and they're so aggressive. But because they've got such different skill sets, we have a rangy tie boxer with a really good knee and kicking game. And then we have a, a short, aggressive berserker that will swarm you with big punches and smash you up against the fence and try and sweep you to the floor where she can continue that work. Whew. It, for me, it's the fight of the night in the yeah, making. Yeah. It's, it's definitely I, the one to watch. Make sure you pay attention to this one. Love watching the straw weights. And there is more stuff coming up after UFC 203. Let's take a look at the schedule. So, Poirier Johnson coming up on September 17th. Chris Seibel versus Lena Landsberg. I was out with Landsberg just this week, actually watching her train. She looks like a threat in that division. Lineker versus Dodson. Talking Fireworks. Of, oh, berserkers Fireworks. and all Both sorts of madness and, like that. 
Lineker at that weight class is terrifying as well yeah. because he doesn't have that taxation on his on his body at the weigh-in, so he can just throw full power as much as he wants, and both of those guys can crack. They definitely can. Talking of guys that can we crack, go. well, we know that this guy can, <laughs> and he knows that he can too, looking to defend his belt for the first time right here in the UK. Yeah, yeah. big Looking for forward us. to that one. So as we come to expect with the sports premiere promotion, there's lots more to look forward to. We'll be back for UFC 204, but in the meantime, enjoy 203 and thanks for watching. Keep your comments and the debate going in the section below and we'll see you next time. On September 10th, the heavyweights are coming. New UFC champion Stipe Miocic defends his title against kickboxing and MMA legend Alistair Overeem. And former heavyweight champion Fabricio Verdun returns to take on Travis Hoppe Brown. Plus, the Octagon debut of former pro wrestling superstar CM Punk. UFC 203. This is big.